Good evening. I'd like to welcome everyone to the Concerned Citizens for Good Government meeting. Uh, we have uh, an excellent presentation this evening. Um, also, I'd like to announce that our next meeting, we're going to have the president and the publisher of the Lafayette Daily Advertiser here. This is Ms. Judy Terzadis, and um, look forward to her presentation. Carol will ask that you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We're very fortunate to, uh, to have uh, Mark uh, Garber here with us this evening. Uh, I've, I've certainly got a dossier on him and a lot of information, and I just want to say that I'm not going to be reading all of it, but anyone that would like to have a copy, uh, I certainly will furnish that and have it. If you'll just let me know this evening, I will have a copy of it at, for the next meeting. Uh, but anyhow, let's see what we can get to know this gentleman a little bit better. He documented success in federal, state, and uh, local law enforcement. Felony prosecuted in L.A. 15th Judicial District, Special Agent United States Secret Service, Assistant Program Manager, Counterintelligence Section, U.S. Air Force, OSI, Chief of, of uh, Narcotics Investigation and Air Force Officer, Special Investigation, Civilian Special Agent Support of Operation of Iraqi Freedom, Police Sergeant, Arlington Police Department, Police Captain, Field Training Officer, Arlington Police Department, Police Officer, Arlington Police Department, Juris Doctorate from South from Southern Methodist University School of Law, Bachelor of Science degree from Louisiana State University in Criminal Justice with a minor in Psychology and Sociology. Work history 2008 to 2014, Assistant District Attorney in Lafayette, Louisiana, 15th Judicial District, felony prosecutor, advised and counsel local law enforcement on search and, and seizure, evidence, arrests, and other <coughs> prosecution issues, and oversee multiple and diverse criminal prosecutings while embarrassed, <coughs> while in, in, uh, co cooperating with the uh, federal, state, and local agencies. 2006 to 2007, Special Agent, United States Secret Service, New York Field Office, <coughs> plan and conduct financial crimes investigation specialized in, in counterfeit currency, bank fraud, credit card fraud, false identification, and protective intelligence investigation, 2005 to 2006. Chief <coughs> Narcotics Investigator, Air Force Office of Special Investigation, plan supervisor, coordinate and to conduct all narcotic investigation that specialize in the utilization of human sources and information under <coughs> undercover operations and joint investigation with the Department of Defense agencies in federal, state, and local law enforcement, testify military court martial hearings in preparation of detailed investigation reported. 2004 and 5 assistant program manager. Air Force Officer Special Investigation, <clears throat> and he conducted criminal fraud and, in, and in counterintelligence investigation prepared and present briefings, detail reports to senior USAF officials, plan, coordinate, and conduct joint investigation of activities, protection services operation with the Department of Defense agencies and federal, state, and local law enforcement, testify in military court martial hearing, court martial hearing, specialized in utilization of human sources inf and informa as information and investigative tasks such as gathering evidence, examining official records, and conducting interrogative inter interviews. And, <clears throat> and of course he has a tremendous work ethic here involving law enforcement. Uh, he has some tremendous awards that he's received, Bronze Star Med <clears throat> Medal, for Special Operation Task Force in Iraq, 2006, U.S. Department of Homeland Security, Director Award, 2004, Federal Law Enforcement Fitness and Achievement Award, 2004, Federal Law and 
Enforcement Training Center driving <coughs> Driver Training Award 2004, United States Secret Service Excel Excellence in Physical Conditioning Award 2007, um, Superior Marksmanship Top Gun Award. He also has many licenses and certifications and certificates rather, and <coughs> that from U.S. Department of Transportation DWI uh, Detention and Standardized Field Sobriety to the United States Secret Service Special Agent Training Course. And as I said, if you would like to have a copy, just let me know. I will furnish that at the next meeting. And without waiting any longer, we'd certainly like to have Mark come up here and tell us about himself. Thank, uh, thank you all for having me tonight. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, my wife, uh, Rachel, uh, sitting in the back uh, with my two daughters. I have uh, Claire and uh, Cece, my nine, nine and five year old. And uh, they're eating right now, and I know they'd love me pointing them out. Uh, also, my mother, Belinda Garber, uh, in the blue blouse right there. Some of you have already met her. Thank you all for coming and uh, supporting me. And uh, Rachel's friend, Chris. Thank you, Chris, for being here. All right. Um, really appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to address this group. Um, I'd like to, to, you know, I guess you've already heard about me as far as my career goes. Um, what I'm bringing to the Lafayette Sheriff's Department is a diverse portfolio of outside experience. And also, uh, as a friend of mine put it, uh, I've been behind the badge, i.e. wearing the badge and doing the job of a uh, police officer and then a plainclothes investigator, and also in front of the badge as a prosecutor. And having been a prosecutor, it put, it's put me in a very unique position of understanding the criminal justice system like I never imagined that I could understand it. I thought that I had it all figured out when I was a cop in my 30s. And, you know, then I, then I thought I had it all figured out when I got out of law school. And, you know, now I realize I don't have anything figured out at all. And I'm, I'm a lot more humble than I, than I used to be. Uh, so, uh, but, but having been a prosecutor and seeing what it takes to convict someone in a court of law with admissible evidence of a charge, has been very instructive to me, and it makes me a better police officer as a result of that. You can teach a police officer, oh, this is what we need to do to convict somebody, but until you've actually had to do it in front of a jury or a judge, uh, it's a whole different ball game. Now I'm in a position even better than I was before to demand the best out of the deputies of the Lafayette Parish Sheriff's Department and out of the employees of the Lafayette Parish Sheriff's Department. I'm also in a position to demand the best conduct. My experience in patrol in Arlington involved everything that a police officer does. I answered domestics, I arrested drunks, I've made over 300 OWI arrests in my time there. I started off before that, that's, that wasn't on the, on the bio, I started off with Ken Goss in Acadia Parish when I was 19 years old. So I've been at this a long time, it's been a passion of mine. Uh, and uh, you know, it's, it's something that I've evolved into, again, with outside experience. Uh, the voters are gonna have a chance to choose this coming October and, and, and maybe in November if there's a runoff uh, against a candidate who has been a street cop their whole entire career, uh, basically a one-dimensional candidate, or a candidate with outside experience and a higher education who can bring that diverse, diversity of experience and that viewpoint into the Sheriff's Department. And I hope that the voters are going to choose my portfolio of experience to lead the Sheriff's Department into the next era. Yeah. The Sheriff's Department as it stands right now, I'd like to say a few remarks about that. Um, Michael Newstrom has been a very, very good Sheriff for the people of Lafayette Parish and for Acadiana by extension. The programs that he's implemented have reduced the crime rate in this, in this whole area. I'm absolutely convinced of that. The data supports it. We have an artificially low crime rate compared to what it should be, and I'm convinced that it's because of the programs that attack recidivism. And what I, what I mean by recidivism is people are gonna get out and commit crimes again they can, as soon as they get out of prison. What, else, what other options do they have typically, right? They get out of prison and they go back home and they start looking up whatever friends that they have who happen to not be in prison at the time. And what are they gonna do when they start hanging out together? Well, <laughs> what did they do before? They'll probably do the same thing again. Human beings are relatively predictable. 
And so that's what happens. That's when we get the, this, this crime rate. So you've got this cycle of people going in prison, doing maybe 40% of their time if they're uh, a nonviolent offender, up to 85% of their time if it's a violent crime. Uh, then they get back out into our streets. They have nowhere to go. They don't have the money to move to Tallahassee, Florida, or Los Angeles, uh, California. They're going to go right back to where they were. And if they don't have any options, they're going to go back to doing whatever it is that they do. If they cook dope, they're going to cook dope. If they were a burglar, they're going to start burglarizing. So what's the answer to that? Well, the answer, I think, has already been established by our current sheriff. You put them in a program where it gives them a chance at some dignity and self-respect. It, it gives them a chance to get out with some money in their pocket and to work while they're in there. And, and much to my pleasant surprise, and there's, lot, there's not enough pleasant surprises in government, it seems like, but much to my pleasant surprise, these, these work release inmates, uh, if they're earning a decent wage, and most of them are, are actually paying their own way. They're actually paying for the expenses of their own incarceration. And that's music to my ears as a small business owner and as a taxpayer, because I'm not for raising taxes and I'm not for big government. And I think that when we've got these guys and these, and these women too, who are paying their own way and who are actually working and, and maybe for the first time in their life, they're getting some dignity and some self-respect and they're buying into the, what I call the societal contract which is, hey, if you work hard and you follow the rules, you get rewarded and you get to live a peaceful life and, and enjoy walking down the street and hold your head high. You know, some of them were never exposed to that. Some of them never had that, that opportunity in their life. And I don't claim to be a rehabilitationist. I'm not a social worker. I'm a law enforcement officer. But I know a good thing when I see it. And I think that Sheriff Newstrom has paved the way on the correction side for the next sheriff to continue to serve the community in the way that it needs to be served. Now, on the, there, there's different aspects to the Sheriff's Department, right? There's not just, not all about corrections. So when we think of the Sheriff's Department, we think about what? The car with a star on the door, right? We're right driving down the neighborhood. That's the patrol division. And the Sheriff is also the chief tax collector for the parish and service, and we serve civil process. Um, Make, and, and also the, the basically the, the, uh, the main arrest or, if you will, the agency who conducts the most arrest for failures to appear in court and, and so on, serves all the warrants for the parish. Not to take anything away from the other agencies, but that's, that's the sheriff's department's role. As the next sheriff, one of my main goals is to increase the patrol force and increase the resources available to patrol and investigations. That's not a statement that it's been neglected. I think that it's time to lavish some TLC on those other divisions. And uh, I think that the parish as a whole could benefit from that. As the next sheriff, I would also make myself more accessible to the public. Again, nothing, not that, that Mr. Newstrom hasn't. I think that, that my style of being sheriff would be to be present more in the public eye to be present at the livestock shows, the 4-H events, things like that, the, the Ducks Unlimited banquets at, at, uh, at the different uh, public events going on, you'll see me out there. I will be easy to get a hold of if I'm elected sheriff. You will be able to come see me in my office, or I'll come see you. As my secretaries can tell you in my law practice now, I hate being in the office. So I'm always, if I get up to go to the bathroom, they ask me, are you leaving? <laughs> they're watching me so closely because they're afraid I'm going to sneak out seems to be a trade among attorneys, I gather. But uh, at any rate, that's uh, increased patrol staffing, accessibility. Another thing that I've noticed uh, talking to the, the men and women of the Lafayette Parish Sheriff's Department and, and doing my due diligence on the financial side is there's a, um, a, a pay gap that's, that's, while it's not severe, I think it needs to be addressed. I think that the Sheriff's Department is the lead agency in the parish. And as such, it should attract talent into it. It should attract the best and the brightest into it. And I think what we're in a position now of uh, struggling to attract the best, and I think that we're actually in a position where we're, we're losing people to smaller but better paid agencies in the parish. And I'd like to reverse that trend and make the Sheriff's Department the lead agency as far as pay and benefits goes, again, without, if it's possible, without raising taxes. I have an idea. I have a plan uh, that, that I won't address at this meeting, but I have a plan that I think I can make work to do that without raising property taxes. Um, the final thing is to 
of, of the four points anyway that I want to address tonight about the future of the Sheriff's Department is uh, to address the need for increased use of technology. One of the ways that you can better utilize manpower is through the use of technology. A lot of the technology we use wasn't available even 10 years ago, much less 25 years ago. But there's technology now that I discussed on KPL uh, in my interview on Friday that uh, would enable us to actually better predict where crime is going to occur. It's called predictive analytics. And what you're doing is it, law enforcement agencies in general are great at gathering data. Okay, we have a whole bunch of data that we gather all the time on everybody we come in contact with on a significant level. And so we have all this data, but I don't think historically law enforcement has been very good at using the data. Um, and we, we don't even, we didn't even know we weren't that good at using it. We didn't know we were supposed to use it. How do you, you know, it, it, it's a relatively new concept. But with the, the analytical software that's available now, the analysts whose vocation it is to, to sort of help okay, where, where are we having burglaries? Where are we having drug dealing? Can actually tell us with a reasonable degree of certainty where our next problem spot is going to develop. It's, it's really neat stuff. It's available now. And our case management system at the Sheriff's Department in order to reach this next level of efficiency is going to have to be updated. And the update would cost, uh, you know, two to three million dollars to update that software system. But by doing that, you're going to use your manpower more effectively. And if I see that it's a better deal for the taxpayer, then that's going to be one of the items on my agenda. I know we need to do it, but whether or not we do it or not depends on the actual, the actual nuts and bolts down the road. Can I answer any questions or concerns? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, how do you feel about the Lafayette Sheriff's Department starting to use those um, officer cameras, so like the personal cameras that you know the officer would bring everywhere with them. And then also, um, I don't know if I read it or saw it on KETC or something, but there was an article um, about crime cameras in Lafayette. Okay. Would that be maintained by the Sheriff's Department? Is that something about what you were talking about with the analytical software? Or Okay, well, the, the first, okay. yeah, and I, we got to take the questions one at a time because yeah. I'm, I'm prone to just answer your second question and not answer your first question. <laughs> okay. uh, the, the, the first question was, how do I feel about the use of body cameras? That's a, a, a very much in vogue given the, the recent events in our country and, okay, what really happened? I think that, that cameras in general, and, and I, I, I'm accustomed to cameras in a patrol car. Okay, so we can see what's, what's happening in front of the car. And a lot of times that captures what we need to capture. I think a body camera is a great idea. It feels really good when you think about it. Like, yeah, why not, right? We should all have, cops should all have body cameras all over their body, right? We should have a rear-facing body camera, a front-facing side views. I mean, why not? Well, but then when you start thinking about it, what about the privacy issue, okay? Uh, Officer Johnson comes to your house for a domestic, and now we're recording everything that's in your house. You know, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's an open question that hadn't been addressed yet constitutionally. Is there a privacy concern and, and, and are we violating people's privacy? Because if you just, if, if you let the, the cops just, you know, start recording everything, we'll do it, but you may not like that, okay? You might like the, sub, the subjective side of it, but on the flip side of it, I think that there's some concerns that we haven't really begun to understand yet. We haven't really dealt with those questions about, well, how does this impact privacy? Is it a violation of people's privacy to do that? You know, and where do we go? Where do cops go where this might not be appropriate? You see what I mean? So on the, everybody here was thinking before I brought that up probably about, you know, the thing on the street, right? And, you know, well, he did, he grabbed the cop's gun. No, he didn't. You know, there were witnesses there. No, there weren't. You know, and so on and so forth. Who was, you know, who did what to who? And that, for that, it's great. It's an absolutely great tool because let me tell you, I am a critical consumer of the law enforcement product. As an assistant DA, I was a very, very critical consumer of the investigative product of the police. Oftentimes, I would send back the, the DA investigator and either find exculpatory evidence or find the rest of the story that I needed to get a case uh, resolved to where before I'd even file a bill of information on the case. And I'm a very critical consumer of the police interaction with the public. 
and I will hold the deputies of the Sheriff's Department to the highest standards as far as their courtesy, even in the face of discourtesy. But where we go with the body cameras, that remains to be seen. I think we'll have to leave an ellipsis right there uh, and, and pick up the discussion later on uh, as these issues get addressed. Now, the other question was the uh, cameras on the poles, right? Yeah, the uh, pole, well, I call them, yeah, pole cameras, crime cameras. I'm assuming they're on a pole. They could be in a tree or somewhere else. So uh, I think that that's a, that's a good idea in public areas to have these, these cameras. Uh, there are some now. Uh, I don't want to discuss the capabilities of the Lafayette Police Department or the Lafayette Sheriff's Department in a public forum because I think that, that the law enforcement, you know, we, we appreciate that to be remain confidential because we don't want that for ex extreme public dissemination. There is a cost benefit to that, okay? Who's going to watch all this and, and, and how do you maintain those cameras? Okay, and, and how much does it cost to maintain them? There's a tipping point there. Now, a lot of times in an investigation, we're able to find camera footage from the LCG traffic cams or from the 7-Eleven store camera or, or from a bank camera, and that aids in an investigation. A lot of times what, you know, because you, you can hardly do anything in this day and time without being on camera, without the police putting up a bunch of extra cameras anyway. But am I in favor of it in limited, under the right circumstances? Yes. As long as it doesn't cost the taxpayers more than it's worth on the, on the, the cost-benefit analysis. That's something that I'm, 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 a, I'm a tight guy with money, and uh, I, you know, I, I want to make sure that we always get the cost-benefit out of any measure that we take. Not just can we afford to buy it, but how much does it cost to maintain it? Did that answer your, address your questions? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, Appreciate your question. Uh, any question, though, we, we're wanting you to come up and do that, but we want to run it, be able to run it through our cameras, and so that the, the uh, people that are out here can understand the question to start with. So if you'll come up and ask the question from here, so we can have an idea of what the question is. That's a good idea. Uh, we have we have Mr. Ray Green here already to start up. Hello again. We had an interesting discussion before the meeting tonight. I'm impressed. Plus the fact I'll give him five points extra because he's an Air Force brother of mine. <laughs> Since you're talking about saving money, I have personally talked to Sheriff Joe in Phoenix, Arizona, and they've got a system that works out real well, and that is the possibility of a tent city for lesser charges, deadbeat deads, habitual DWIs, traffic offenders, and so forth. It would save a lot of money. They're saving millions of dollars in Arizona. Now, I promise you this, you put some of these guys out there in the wintertime with no heat and in the summertime with no air conditioning, with nothing to drink but coffee and water, they're going to think about it and the recidivism is going to go way down. What do you think? <laughs> Tent cities work pretty well in Arizona, although I think that Jer Sheriff... Uh, our Pio's department uh, probably the, the costs are outweighed by the the uh, or the cost savings may be outweighed by the lawsuits that they're having to defend against and pay uh, for that county uh, number one uh, and and I'll be a very a very tough customer on these on these uh, outside litigation counsel uh, whenever we're obtaining them to defend us uh, from any legal actions but as far as the tent city in Louisiana that the humidity alone would create the kind of conditions that would would get it shut down it's 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 feasible in a place like arizona because it's a dry climate uh and i think they can get away with it there because of the difference in climate and the lack of disease and proclivity for disease but by the same token if we tried that over here i think that it would be it would amount to something that would reach a level of, of inhumane treatment and be shut down by the federal government as we've seen happen in other cases in other parts of the country and the last thing i'd want to do is lead this parish this government into a situation where i cost us more money than i actually saved and so i'd be very cautious before i did something like that yes, and i'd yes. want to make sure that it would work and inside tent cities 
<laughs> and inside Ken <Tent> City, <laughs> we've got an excellent. Yeah, let me tell you about the facility on Willow Street. It's a, it's an, I think it's an excellent facility. It's laid the groundwork for the next 50 years. Um, we have an unused shell of a building that hadn't been finished out on the inside yet for future expansion. And we've got work release out there and, and, a, and a, a lot of other ancillary programs to it. But we're not housing secure DO, the Department of, uh, you know, basically state prisoners, okay? We're, we're not housing secure DOC prisoners out there right now because of staffing. Because the Sheriff's Department has not been able to hire enough qualified people to staff that, that uh, facility. But the federal government has set up a process wherein they decide who gets just how we can get another president. speaker before you just hold on. Okay. You be the next question. question. No, no. You can go you can ahead. No, okay. Come on up. Thank you for being here. Yes. Federal government has set up uh, regulations for prisoners. You have to give them air conditioning, multi-channel TV, quality <laughs> food, things like this. We put them in a tent city out in the swamp, and believe me, they're going to go a long way to find illegal activities in other states. They won't want to come back to Lafayette Parish. I don't doubt that. <laughs> and as, a, as a state and under constitutional rules, we can determine what we give to prisoners gift prisoners, and we do not have to buy by federal rules on that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for coming to the program this evening. I appreciate it. The, um, got a few questions. Um, and I know there's a lot of Garbers around town. And the mic, please. I know there are a lot of Garbers around town. How long have you been a resident of Lafayette or Acadiana? Well, I was, I was uh, raised in Acadiana. Uh, I've been on a, a raised on a farm uh, in Iota, Louisiana. My grandfather had a dairy farm uh, right there on Johnson Street by Fire Station, uh, is it 13 or whatever fire station that is right there on Johnson Street, right past the Acadiana Mall. His name was Walter Garber. He had uh, one of the top, maybe the top Holstein herd in the state. And when I was in the third or fourth grade, uh, he determined that, well, my, my father, Wayne Garber, who had gone on and uh, gotten a master's degree in economics, and his brother, uh, Earl Garber, who was working for the Soil Conservation Service, which is now the NRCS, <coughs> decided that they wanted to form. It had gotten in their blood, and they had gone to college and were having their other careers, and they wanted to come back and form with him. So uh, he, in the meantime, his form was being encroached by the neighborhoods. I remember there was a lawn dart and a cow one time, and people were messing up the fences and trespassing on his pastures and it was just inhibiting his operations and uh, it, it, it kind of was a perfect set of circumstances. Well, you know, he, he was going to sell his herd and his land that was by then more valuable and he was able to do some kind of an exchange and we, I remember taking these long boring trips when I was a kid looking at farmland and, uh, you know, and I remember thinking, man, it's exciting, you know, where am I going to move to? and they found some affordable land. Apparently it was affordable enough in Iota, Louisiana, uh, which is about 45 minutes away from here. And so I was raised uh, at that point on a rice, soybean, and sweet potato farm. And uh, after that, uh, after going to uh, St. Francis Elementary, Iota High School, I went to LSU E in Eunice uh, for two years and then finished up my degree at LSU in Baton Rouge and uh, then proceeded on with my law enforcement career. Of all the reasons that you've given this evening, uh, what are the two most important priorities that you're going to implement within your first 90 days of taking office should you be elected? Accessibility is going to be implemented even before I take office because I wouldn't take office if I were elected until July 1 of 2016 because the sheriff takes office. Uh, he, he doesn't leave office until June the 30th. Um, so I would be accessible and start my transition even before that time. Uh, accessibility being number one. Number two would be a complete review of all existing programs to determine whether or not uh, I was going to continue to support those programs and how I was going to continue to support those programs. Even if a program is doing well, it doesn't mean it doesn't bear a review. 
and I don't want my, con my comments to be taken out of context. Review doesn't mean I'm going to ax it or look to ax it. It means I'm going to review it. And it, it's a business. It needs to be the correction side of the sheriff's department, I'll go so far to say, needs to be run like a business. Because that is how, in my opinion, you do not increase taxes and you, and you run it efficiently. I know how to run a business, and that's how I'd be looking at these programs. Is it a good decision for the taxpayers of Lafayette Parish? So a review of the programs would be the second thing. Got a few more questions. Um, what role, if any, can the Lafayette Parish Sheriff play in assisting uh, the Lafayette Parish School Board in reducing student truancy problems? I think that it's an excellent question. I think that that attacking the the or addressing, I think attacking may be the wrong word, but addressing juvenile crime or juvenile uh, children in need of supervision, as they're, as they're technically legally called. They can't be criminals, but they can't have criminal responsibility, they're, they're in need of supervision, is an excellent way to protect and serve our community because chances are they're going to continue down that path. Uh, already in Lafayette, we have uh, what's been created as the Juvenile Assessment Center. And instead of simply taking a truant or a juvenile offender to juvenile detention and essentially throwing them in, in junior jail and having them exposed to, uh, you know, basically uh, a, a mini school in there, teach them how to be a better criminal, we have them taken to the assessment center and they're assessed by professional counselors and we find out what's the root issue. Okay, why, why are you being truant? Why, instead of punishing them for being truant, What's the, what's the issue? What's going on at home? And then bringing in the, the proper resources to address that truancy, and that's already been a, a very, very successfully addressed, and I look forward to continuing to support the Juvenile Assessment Center and expanding it. Thank you. Uh, what role do you envision your administration, if you're elected sheriff, will play in providing drug education classes in our elementary, middle school, and high school? I would engage with the, uh, the, the whoever our superintendent uh, ends up being uh, and ask them for an opinion to help guide the sheriff's department on how we can best serve the, the educators. We have professional educators and I would defer to their judgment on how we can do that. We're definitely going to do it, but the manner in which we do it uh, and how we integrate into the schools I think is best done in concert with the, the educators in this parish, but I'm completely 100% for it. Uh, I think that that, that like everything else uh, that we've been doing for, uh, you know, the administration under, under Sheriff Newstrom, uh, I expect to uh, enhance what's been, what's been done in the past. And I think that, that addressing the possibility of drug abuse through education is going to serve our community in a positive way by reducing the amount of drugs that are abused. Absolutely. Thank you. All right. Appreciate the question. In 1939, I'm Pablo. I went to Iowa High School. I don't remember seeing Mark there at the high school in 1939. Did you show you about that? I'm not, I'm not sure of where I was in 1939. <laughs> he was there. Uh, also, uh, about um, back in 1952, I bought a, um, a Garber uh, dairy farm on the south side of Lafayette. And I built a home and I stayed there for a good long while. So the dairy farm was moved out then. That's when it moved to Iowa, right? When it, after I bought the property or before, before I bought the property? 52, 1952. Well, it, well, Bob Lowe. Bob Lowe? Yep. My mom's asking, uh, asking me who you what your name is. But <laughs> well, we didn't, uh, I am the oldest living Marine in South Louisiana. <laughs> <laughs> I did the bad harbor thing. Hmm? Good. Now, the question that I have from Mark would be this. It's, uh, you know, 
for probably 50 years now in Lafayette, every sheriff we've had, we've had has had gray hair and been pretty, pretty heavy in the haunches over there. And is he going to change that trend? We have to get people to think in terms of a sheriff not being big and heavy, so we've got to change the image a little bit there, Mike. But my question is this. In the last 15 years, Mike Newstrom has been a sheriff that we can all be proud of. Um, did he do anything, or was there a trend, or anything started, Mark, during that 15 years that you disagree with? Do it show a difference of opinion over there? Anything at all? So the, the question is, if I understand it correctly, do I disagree with Sheriff Newstrom's uh, programs or policies over the last 15 years? Is that some of them? Any of them. I can't think of anything that I disagree with. I don't think it's possible to agree with another human being on everything over the course of 15 years. So, <laughs> yes, uh, no, no comment. <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I just don't think it's it's possible. But uh, I think that that, as you acknowledged, Sheriff Newstrom has served our community very, very well uh, as its chief law enforcement officer. He's laid a great foundation for the future, and I look forward to carrying that forward. I'm currently working with some state senators and some state legislators in trying to get a bill passed, and I was told just this morning that Senator Cortez is going to introduce a bill to the legislature this year mandating that all high school seniors in Louisiana public schools have to pass the same survey that all immigrants have to pass to become citizens of the United States of America. Because I can give you many, many examples of people in public office not knowing their left hand from the right about the Constitution. We need to do something about it, and I can't think of a better place than high schools in Louisiana. So if they do not pass this survey, then they will not graduate from high school. And as I say, we've got several senators and several legislators, the assistant school superintendent, and many other people that are for this. I have yet to meet one single person that's against the idea. How do you feel about this? I don't see a single thing wrong with what's being proposed. As someone who has, has put it on the line for our Constitution uh, in Iraq in 2005, uh, I came back with even a greater appreciation of our way of life. I've traveled to different parts of the world, uh, not only when I, when I went to war in Iraq, but also uh, on other details for the OSI. And we enjoy an unprecedented level of peace and security in our communities, for our families. We don't have to worry about so many things that people have to worry about in other parts of the world, both from our government and from criminal elements and, and, and so on. So, you know, I, I, I absolutely am in favor of, uh, of what's being proposed. Can I quote you? May I quote you? I think I am already, uh, I'm on, on the record. <laughs> Probably with cameras, basically a storage and retention of memory. I want you to come up. No, I'm fine. I want to work with the camera. Um, my dad uh, was chief of police of Jennings, Louisiana, for 27 years. And he's passed away now. But I remember him being a little bit amazed at some of the training that is now done with the police forces. Now, we've seen on national TV. Uh, shootings of individuals, say, in Florida and Ferguson and other places, New York and such places as that, and, in, 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 of course, revenge shootings of police. But my father was very concerned that police are now being trained uh, that when they aim a gun at someone, uh, they'll give a, one or two warnings, maybe three warnings, and then they shoot. They shoot to kill. 
And it, my father was just dismayed about that. He said, you know, my dad had to shoot his gun at a person one time during the whole 27 years that he was a cop. He shot the guy in the leg. Uh, and the fellow was trying to jump a ditch and come at my dad at the time. And of course, the bullet hit him in midair and flipped him, and that was it. Um, but, you know, he said, you shoot to wound, not to kill. And, and you know, looking at the Ferguson incident and incidents that happened in Florida, I'm kind of wondering if they had shot to wound instead of to kill, would we be having riots? Would we be having incidences of, uh, you know, more and more turmoil within the society. Okay. So I just want to know how you feel about that. All right. It's an excellent question, and, and, I, and it gives me an opportunity to clear up some, some misconceptions about the use of a firearm, okay? A firearm is considered deadly force, all right? And if I shoot you in the leg and I hit your femoral artery, you're going to bleed out in a matter of uh, very, very quickly, okay? So shooting you in the leg or the kneecap, if I shoot you in the knee, it could travel up your body and go through your torso and come out your shoulder. There's no way to use deadly force, and there's no excuse to use deadly force like a handgun or a shotgun or a rifle unless you have justification to use deadly force. That's it. And police officers, in my experience, have never been taught to shoot to kill or to shoot to wound. We shoot to stop the threat. Okay, that's, that's the goal. The goal is to stop the threat. And you stop shooting when you perceive the threat to have been dealt with. So it's never the goal of the police to kill someone. That's the military's job, okay? The military tries to kill people. Um, police shoot to stop the threat. I cannot emphasize that enough. That is what policemen are taught. That is how they're trained. And they don't, you know, to, to, to try to, and I have no doubt that your dad purposefully shot someone in the leg. But that was then, and I'll tell you that right now, and ever since I've been in law enforcement, we are trained to shoot in the center mass of a person, and we're shooting to stop the threat. We hope that they don't, are not lethally wounded by that. We just want to stop the threat under the most dire of circumstances. And that's not something that, that anyone, who, you know, wants to do under, you know, or wants to go through the aftermath of a shooting. Um, and, it, and it gives me a good segue to address uh, to address training. Um, there's a, going back to my days in Arlington, uh, I was in charge of a full-time SWAT team. That was one of the assignments I held there. I was in my early 30s. It was a very prestigious assignment to even be on the full-time SWAT team, but to be the sergeant in charge of the SWAT team was even a more prestigious assignment. And I was a straight arrow type of a guy, and I'll, I'll tell you all the story of meeting my wife if time permits, but that was another thing that came out of that, being on the SWAT team. Uh, she was a police recruit that came through Arlington. Um, but I, I want to talk about training since you brought it up. Uh, we were tasked, my unit was tasked with conducting uh, active shooter training. And for those of you who don't, if that doesn't ring a bell, an active shooter is a homicide in progress, like a school shooting. Okay, we have a, uh, and the typical police doctrine in that day was to contain and isolate a threat. If we have a, a, a shooter in a building, the patrol cops would get there, first responders, and you isolate it, you make sure that they can't get out of the building, and then we call out to you or call into you or try to communicate, hey, come out with your hands up, and if not, you know, we're gonna come in and get you, okay? In, in, in a very succinct uh, uh, form, even though it takes a lot longer to, you know, to go through all those, those steps, right? Well, it doesn't do you any good to contain and isolate if there's an active homicide going on. We don't want our kids getting shot while the police say, all right, we're forming a good perimeter and let this guy shoot as many people as he wants to in a school. That obviously doesn't work. So my unit was tasked with implementing, designing and implementing active shooter training, we called it. So I went to some outside schools and I went to see what Dallas SWAT was doing. We cross-trained a lot with the Dallas SWAT uh, people and uh, came back with a lesson plan. I'm a certified police instructor and a certified firearms instructor. So we had a lesson plan and we implemented a, a plan and uh, the best laid plans can go awry. Um, we were conducting training with uh, a, something called simunitions. It actually shoots a projectile out of a, a duty weapon. You can modify a police officer's duty pistol and it'll shoot a projectile. And about six days into the training, I was uh, called away to conduct a more hazardous operation. I was the, in charge of that and I conducted the classroom part, but after I conducted the classroom part, 
of the of the school the next phase was the demonstration phase and then followed by the scenarios and we had we were doing this training at a school where we had a two-story school the first floor was the classroom and demonstration phase and the demonstration was to okay here's the simunitions cartridge and here's the uh, simunitions modified pistol that's going to fit in your holster and here's the mask that you're going to wear and we would fire it at a traffic cone that I had because it was a nice plastic surface that would show the mark of the paint on it and we'd go on about our business and make sure everybody was fitted with a mask and take the students up four at a time onto the next floor where we would shoot at people and at that point we would disarm them of their weapons well when I was about 12 miles away uh, the, the, the subordinate that I left in charge of the operation who was an acting sergeant at the time uh, decided to demonstrate on a person and the end result of that was that one of my men shot and killed another one of my men and so it was a, a horrible accident it happened in 2001 and I offer that to you to show uh, you know that, that you know even under the, it, the training you know how hard police officers train and sometimes you know just like the military there are deadly training accidents just like the helicopter crash uh, in Florida where we lost 11 soldiers you know and, and training hard has its cost but deadly force that's deadly force training and that training was was being conducted even back then by Arlington Police Department and we lost the life of a police officer and in fact we lost two police careers because the officer who shot him of course was was uh, could could no longer serve as a police officer. I, I, they they terminated him, but he couldn't he couldn't do his job anyway. He was so uh, guilt ridden. Some of you also there's going to be a there was some litigation that came out of that by the decedent's family against the city of Arlington, uh, and I ended up suing the city of Arlington as well for uh, the motion that I underwent, even though I was 12 miles away going to conduct a uh, it was called a buy bust. It's a narcotics operation. I was demoted a rank uh, back to police officer and I was going to SMU law school at the time. I didn't quit. I kept, I stayed for almost another year to finish my law degree and then I resigned. And then I filed suit against the chief of police for some remarks he made that I considered to be uh, untrue. And uh, that was, that's something that, uh, again, if you look into my background, you'll see that that, that, that all occurred. And I want to offer that to this group as part of my credentials as to why I should leave the Lafayette Sheriff's Department because I've been through some very difficult things in police work. I've done the work of, of uh, not only the, the, the fun work I call the car chases and, 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 and fighting with people and things like that, but I've also uh, planned budgets and I've also dealt with the death of uh, a fellow officers under tragic circumstances. And I know the importance of keeping our men and women safe. I know the importance of training hard and training safely at the same time and I know unfortunately of the experience of dealing with uh, a tragedy within an agency and how that affects agencies long term and the culture of that agency and I wanted y'all to know about it since we got on that subject. I can assure you that if someone tries to break into me or my car or my house after the second shot, the deal is over. They're down. Now, can we not establish something? Some of these uh, violations that have come up when they fired 12 and 15 shots, surely a police officer, well trained in marksmanship, could get the opponent down after one, two, or three, or the most five shots and limit the shots and not have to have them drain the gun into that person. Good well, I, I, the, the question was, um, this gentleman carried the five-shot Smith & Wesson revolver and uh, <laughs> estimates that it would take him no more than two shots to deal with any deadly force situation. <laughs> and, and why can't the, the police uh, use uh, fewer bullets in a, in a gunfight or a deadly force situation? And, uh, you know, as, as a police officer, you're accountable for every round you fire. They tell you that over and over again. You're accountable for it. Okay, it doesn't matter if you were in a panic or whatever, you're supposed to not panic, okay? I, under ideal circumstances, yeah, I would like to see that happen. I would like to see, you know, unfortunately, if we have to have a deadly force encounter, I would like to see one to two shots to stop the threat, okay, and to, and to end that, that encounter and to get control of the situation. But police officers are human beings, and you can't, 
even we'd be here for the rest of our lives talking about the different scenarios that can come up when you're dealing with human beings, police officers, and human being suspects. I mean, you just can't tell what kind of situation you're going to be in. Um, you know, or, or how you're going to, a given police officer, no matter what they're training, is going to, how they're going to handle that situation. I was in charge of a situation in Arlington where we shot a person on, on my instructions. We shot him with an M16. Uh, he was a barricaded murder suspect. And that was a very clean, it was a three round burst and one round hit him, the other two went right past his head up into the soffit. It was a very safe use of force. It was very controlled. He was pointing a gun at us and and we, we did what we had to do, and he uh, he lived through the incident. It was it was uh, it ended the threat. Uh, there were other situations where uh, a couple of colleagues of mine were answering a domestic disturbance in an apartment complex. They drove up, and they they're in the complex. It was a field training officer and his rookie who was driving, and they come head to head with the suspect. He's in a some kind of a little Mazda. I think he was in a Mazda Miata, and he immediately pulls out a Glock 19 and starts shooting at him and putting rounds through his windshield, through their windshield. And there was a round in the headrest where this woman police officer had been just a second before. And she was completely uh, unraveled by that. And there were some rounds that went into the neighboring apartment buildings in that ensuing gunfight, okay? This guy actually emptied his 15 round magazine at the cops, reloaded and kept shooting. This was a very determined suspect. So sometimes you get people like that, and it takes more rounds to put them down because they're actually putting effective fire onto you. And so, you know, this, uh, the, field, the field training officer finally shot him, uh, I believe, in the head and, and ended the, the gunfight. But, you know, they had to get their composure first because they, they walked in. It was an extreme uh, situation. Great question. Good. <laughs> you had your question answered? I can get it later. It's about storage and technical stuff. You know, it, it's kind of like your red flex cameras. There's no storage for them. You know, so if somebody is in an accident, how do you go back and how do you retain the actual accident having having happened itself? Okay, same thing with officers. You know, with the cameras, how long will it be? How much storage information? Well, we used to be, yeah, how much, the question is, how much can we store? That's right. Um, quite a bit now, quite a bit can be stored now very cheaply, okay? I remember when a one gig uh, thumb drive, we call it stick drive, whatever you want to call it, used to cost, that That was like a huge thing, right? And and when I was in college, you know, we had the big floppy disk, like the size of a sheet of paper, and then we had the smaller ones, which were much more rugged, and that was like state-of-the-art technology then. I thought, man, I can store all kinds of stuff on this thing. And, you know, then we got the stick drive, which was high speed, uh, low drag, as we say in the military, and that was great. And that was expensive, cutting-edge technology. And now you can get a 30-gig stick drive for, you know, 20 bucks or $19 or something like that. So storage has gotten very economical. But, you know, there's still the other questions of how long do these cameras last? how long do the batteries last and so on. And, and look, that's not something that, that we can even get into in a forum like this, even if I had all the answers, because by the time some decision got made down the road, that it, it, the equation will have changed. But, you know, that's, that's a good thing and a bad thing, right? It's a good thing that we keep advancing technology-wise and smaller, lighter, better. Uh, but, you know, it, it changes all the time. See, that's why they want it. <laughs> We have time for another question. Uh, if someone has that, uh, uh, Mr. Kidry over there from uh, Scott area, he usually has at least one question. I've known him for a long time. Why don't you come up? You have a question? Uh, what do you feel about concealed weapon, like, like a concealed weapon Here. license? The question is, uh, how do I feel about uh, concealed carry by non-law enforcement, correct? I'm, comp I'm in support of that. I'm in support of the Second Amendment. I believe in the right to, to, to bear arms by the citizenry. I think that the Founding Fathers had it correct, and I completely support that right. As long as you're a citizen in good standing, I absolutely support it.
Well, we, we've got an hour in, and we should have a pretty good uh, film out of this. Is that correct? Okay. Well, we appreciate uh, Mr. Garber being here this evening. We certainly are owe him a round of applause, and we appreciate you coming in. In the race? Yeah. Well, we, we don't know for sure. I think, I think the gentleman from Scott's supposed to run, is what I understand, and one other gentleman is a state trooper. I'm trying to his name. I'm not for sure who all is running in the sheriff's race. I'm just concerned about my campaign and running for the office. That's a good <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Well, in other words, no more questions. We appreciate everyone coming here this evening, and we're uh, calling the meeting. It, stand, it stands adjourned. And on the 6th, remember that we have this lady from the Daily Advertiser. And if you want to come and, you know, find out what uh, we maybe need to ask her a few questions concerning what happens in South Louisiana. So we'd appreciate attendance next time. So thank you all very much, and you all have a good evening. Adios. Thank you.